Ähm, äh, okay, so um, uh, the title of my talk is Humans Learn from Task Descriptions and so should uh, our models and this is joint work with uh, Timo Sheik and Sahana Udupa. So I want to start uh, with the questions, how do humans learn with a pomegranate? Let's look at a typical example of human learning, how to open and eat a pomegranate. Uh, and uh, we're going to watch uh, about a minute of a YouTube video. Uh, and the, it's really difficult to uh, get the sound right uh, through Zoom. So uh, I'm just going to give you the closed captions. So pre please read the closed captions, okay? And, and then, me, sorry, just one thing. Could you go full screen afterwards for your slides? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the, the presentation software I'm using, so I'm on a Linux system. And uh, the the Foxit reader doesn't allow me uh, to give you a better okay. uh, a better full screen version than than what you're seeing right now. That's that that's it. Thanks. Uh, just to be sure. Um, yeah, I, I probably should uh, invest uh, and buy um, an iPad or something like that. But uh, on this system, it looks like this is the open the only option. Um, my system administrator has looked in this already, into this already. Okay, so uh, we're going to watch this video and uh, read the closed captions and pay attention to two things. The descriptions that the instructor gives. So there's gonna be an instructor who tells you how to open and eat a pomegranate. So uh, uh, pay attention to the descriptions he gives and count the number of training instances that are available in that uh, video, okay? So let's see if we can get this to work. So I guess I have to actually stop sharing. Um. One second. Can you uh, see the video and uh, read the captions? We can see the video, yes. Great, great. Uh, so as I said, pay attention to the descriptions the instructor gives and uh, to the number of training instances. So then it goes on, uh, but we're not going to watch that. Okay, let me share the presentation again. Okay. So what did we see here? Uh, the teacher gives a detailed description of the task and of the solution. Uh, we um, get a task description uh, from the teacher, a way of opening and eating the, the pomegranate that is not a pain in the butt and not messy. So that's what we want to achieve. And the solution description, score the pomegranate along the ridges. And there are a few training instances. So uh, for the scoring of the pomegranate, there were three if you counted them. And of course, there's more uh, in that video uh, for the other parts of how to open a pomegranate, but that's, that's just the beginning. 
So I would argue this is a typical form of human learning, detailed uh, descriptions and very few training instances, uh, 10 or fewer. Now, of course, there are many different types of uh, human learning uh, and probably there are some where you have lots and lots of training instances and there's also many where you don't have a de uh, description, maybe you just imitate somebody uh, as you observe them. But um, I, I think this is a form of human learning that is, as I said, typical and that uh, every one of us has encountered. Compare that to our typical machine learning setup. No descriptions, large training sets, and even few shot learning often uses thousands of examples, uh, which arguably is not really few shot if you have thousands of examples. So the motivation for our approach is uh, humans take advantage of task descriptions. Machine learning models generally don't uh, today. How can we incorporate task descriptions into NLP? And so I'm an LP person uh, nowadays uh, focusing on LP, but of course you can easily see how this also would be very relevant for IR and other fields. Okay, so that was already the first part of the talk. Uh, and uh, the next part is going to be our uh, particular method of uh, using task descriptions in uh, few short learning, which we call PET, Pattern Exploiting Training. Then there will be an experimental section where I compare PET uh, with GPT-3, which is uh, which probably everybody has heard of. And then there's a section on debiasing and at the end related work and outlook. Uh, before I start, uh, let me uh, introduce the team. Uh, so there's Timo, he came up with the basic idea and did the actual work. Uh, then there's Sahana Udupa, uh, she uh, uh, contributed mainly to the second part of the talk, Deep Icing. She's a professor of media anthropology here at the University of Munich uh, and then myself. Okay, pattern exploiting training, PET. So um, the basic idea is, uh, so we have a task and uh, in this case, the task is sentiment analysis. So we have a review uh, of a restaurant uh, we have some labels for this review, and then we have a classifier that uh, assigns to each review one of the labels. And uh, what we want to do is we want to convert this task into a task description. And we're doing this, why are we doing this? We're doing this because instead of using a regular classifier, we want to use a pre-trained language model, in this case, a masked language model to solve the task. Now, as language models, what's nice about them is that they have some basic understanding of language. I mean, some people object to the word understanding, uh, but I, I think it's okay to say that the, the, this understanding is by no means perfect, but the, I think it is very um, justified to say they have some basic understanding of natural language. So by giving the model as description, it, uh, already gets a lot of information about the task. And then the hope is that if we just give it a few training instances in addition to that, then uh, it will um, be able to do well on the task. Okay, so um, the task description has two parts. The first part is the verbalizer. And uh, this is simply uh, a um, mapping of the labels to natural language words. So zero here is mapped to bad and one is mapped to good. And again, the idea is the language model understands what bad and good mean. So by uh, telling it, you know, we have these labels here and they correspond to these words, it basically has now an understanding of the labels without having been trained on anything. Um, the second part of the uh, task description is the pattern. And let me just show you the pattern we actually use here, or one of the patterns. In it was mask. Uh, so what the mask language model is going to do is it's going to substitute for the mask uh, one of the two labels here, bad or good. Um, and again, uh, the assumption is that it has some basic understanding of this pattern. Input it was mask. So input uh, we're just going to put the 
um, the restaurant review here uh, as a substitute for the variable input so that we get then, for example, excellent pizza, it was mask. And then uh, the mask language model has to substitute one of the words for mask. So the idea is um, the um, mask language model has some understanding of these patterns and therefore uh, it can do the substitution task um, uh, well and therefore solve the task. Uh, so why does it have this understanding? Because this here is the type of pattern that occurs a lot in pre-training pre corpora. So, so basically you have description and then you have a summary sentence like it was mask and uh, mask is some adjective. And uh, so the language model learns to predict the correct adjective. Um, so again, it appeals to the language model's uh, ability uh, to understand language. How do we create the pattern? We need uh, the designer's understanding of the task to be able to create a good pattern. This pattern has to uh, satisfy two conditions. One is what I already said, the um, language model, um, it must be um, something that typically occurs in the pre-training data of the language model. And the second, of course, is that it must be a good description of the task. So, uh, and, and that is something that only the human designer knows. So um, that's, we need a human designer here who creates the pattern. Um, so that's the, the basic idea of uh, the task description. We convert the task to a task description and it consists of these two um, parts, the pattern and the verbalizer. Now, um, in contrast to some other work in this uh, space, we do fine tuning of the language model. And uh, let me just explain it and then uh, explain to you why this is important. So um, let's say we have a training instance, uh, excellent pizza one. Uh, we use our pattern, review it was mask and substitute the review for input. Then we get excellent pizza, it was mask. That's the input to the mask language model. The mask language model then predicts for this mask, either a good or bad. Of course, it makes predictions for the entire vocabulary of um, uh, subwords. But um, in this case, um, we restrict it uh, to the words from the verbalizer. And that gives us a probability distribution over good and bad. And because um, we have the verbalizer, it also gives us a probability distribution, of course, over the original labels of the task. And uh, now we can uh, use cross entropy since we have the gold uh, label uh, for this restaurant view. Uh, we can use cross entropy to train the language model to fine tune it for this particular pattern. And why do we do that? Uh, my claim was it already understands the pattern. Yes, to some extent it does, but of course this is a very specialized context of using the pattern. So we can improve its understanding by fine tuning. And so um, we can improve the uh, performance of the language model on this task by fine tuning it specifically for this um, pattern that we're using here. So that's the fine tuning part. Um, now, one very critical element of this approach is that it has to be usable with multiple patterns. And um, so we're using a kind of ensembling approach here. And ensembling is of course pretty trivial, but since it's so central, let me just go through it um, here on the slide. Um, so we have an unlabeled instance X, now, it's, I mean, uh, on the previous slide, I showed you what we do with one pattern. We, of course, can use multiple patterns. Uh, so these are here P1, P2, P3. We are substituting our restaurant review into each of these patterns. Then we have fine-tuned um, language models for each of the patterns. So we have a separate one for each pattern. And they then give us scores for the labels of the task. Uh, we can compute an aggregate score for that. And that gives us then our final classification decision. So ensembling here is, is very simple. Um, and here's an example for uh, ensembling uh, for the Yelp data set. So the Yelp data set has one through five stars. Here you see the verbalizer for that. Uh, terrible, bad, okay, good, and great. And here are the four patterns we use for this task. Um, it was mask review, just mask review, review, all in all, it was mask, review, in summary, the restaurant is mask. Um, and so 
one thing you see here is that uh, these two patterns here are quite different from these two. Um, and so um, uh, that points to the fact that there's really no limit uh, to the imagination. You can, uh, as a task designer, as a uh, pattern designer, you can uh, go wild and uh, write down all the patterns that come to mind with the two restrictions that we talked about earlier. They must, of course, correspond to the task and um, it must be something that's likely to have occurred in the pre-training data. Um, so, um, uh, and, and that's a, a good thing. I'm going to continue this thought on the next slide, why multiple patterns are critical. So the patterns provide human expertise and the more the better. So I would argue it's actually a good thing that we uh, need human expertise here. Um, because um, especially in machine learning, there's a lot of um, work that tries to get rid of the human. Uh, but I think uh, that's the wrong approach because um, um, we need inductive bias and inductive biases often come from humans. In most cases, they come from humans. So I think that's a good thing. And uh, realistic few shot learning is difficult without human expertise because few shot learning, you only have a few training instances, uh, but the information about learning the task has to come from somewhere um, and the few training instances are not enough. So I think human expertise are an excellent source of getting that additional information. Now, can we try out multiple patterns and just keep the best one? So maybe you want to use just one. You're happy trying out many, but in the end you want to keep, just keep one. No, because no, there's no deficit in uh, true few shot learning. Now, a lot of work in few shot learning in NLP and also in machine learning uses large deficits, but that's not really a few shot setting because if you have a large deficit, then you're not in a few shot uh, setting. So that's a uh, point that's important to us that in a true few shot uh, setting, you don't have uh, a deficit. Okay. And um, uh, the last element uh, for, um, for PET um, that gives you a couple of percentage points improvement in the performance um, and also um, is important for uh, deployment is iterative training, which we, which we call IPET. And uh, this uses a, a motif in unsupervised learning that's quite common uh, and it also works uh, pretty well here. So. What we do is so we have this initial, let's call it generation of models, one for each pattern. And uh, the assumption is that we have a large unlabeled set of data. That's an additional assumption we're making, not always the case, but in many uh, applications, it is the case. And now what we do is, is we um, run uh, each of the models here of the first generation on the entire unlabeled data. And then uh, we look at the um, most confident predictions of each model. And now we assemble new training uh, sets that are based on these most confident uh, um, predictions of um, the uh, first generation. So for example, this training set T11 here is based on the most confident predictions of uh, M2 and M3. Uh, so now we have training sets that uh, are larger than our initial few shot training sets uh, because they have these, uh, in addition, these automatically labeled uh, training data as well. Uh, we train uh, a second generation of model on uh, these new training sets here. And then we continue this process until uh, the last generation of models uh, where we use the entire uh, unlabeled data. Uh, and then the last step is uh, distillation also something that's commonly done here. Um, so we uh, use the last generation of model to label the entire set of unlabeled data. And then we train a single model, uh, just a ordinary uh, fine tuned language model on this data set. And now we have a single model. So that's nice for deployment and practical uh, purposes if you have a single uh, model. So that's iterative training. And we call this uh, iPad. Okay, so that was uh, the introduction of PET and iPad. Uh, so the basic idea is use it to convert the task into a task description and then 
the um, um, MLM understands the task description and therefore it gets a head start on the task and just needs a few um, training examples to get good performance. Uh, so we leverage the MLM's language understanding. It's important that we can use multiple patterns because we don't have a deficit, a truly few short learning, and it's supervised. Um, maybe I didn't emphasize that enough because some other work, is, especially GPT-3, which I will compare to later, is not supervised. But we fine tune our model for each pattern. And uh, we will see that that actually gives us a huge performance boost because supervised learning is very powerful. So that's also a very important element here. OK, um, so. Um, uh, before I get uh, to the experimental part, let me ask what exactly is a task description? So here we have a straightforward uh, task description actually from uh, GPT-3. Uh, so we have the task description proper translate English to French. Then we have three training examples. Uh, thanks, merci, hello, bonjour, mint, mont. Then we have a close question, cheese, and here, uh, um, uh, language model is supposed to give its uh, answer uh, for Marsh. Actually, this is not straightforward uh, at all because, uh, so for one, the task description here, translate English to French, you can think of a dozen other ways of expressing that. You know, uh, here's a English sentence translated to French, or uh, what's the French translation of X, uh, and so on. So, um, or word instead of sentence. Uh, and there's actually big differences in um, how well pre-trained language models understand different task descriptions. And uh, so uh, it matters how you formulate the task description. And then the, um, uh, if you look at the training instances in the closed question, we have this arrow here. Again, there are dozens of ways of um, formulating these vocabulary equations. Uh, and this is just one. You could also say, you know, the translation of thanks into French is merci. That would be a different, different way of writing these four here. Um, so, um, uh, so it's not straightforward because as I said, there's a big difference in which pattern you choose. The performance can be very different. Uh, and the um, suspicion is that the GPT-3 designers tried out a few and then used one that worked really well. Uh, um, they, they don't directly say that, but uh, it, it's, a, uh, I mean, the, the paper, if you read it, suggests that that's what happened uh, because it um, uh, matters which one, which one you use. Okay, so um, just to give you a sense of how complex um, task descriptions can be. Let me just run through three of them that we use in our work. The first one I already gave you. Uh, so we have the verbalizer here uh, for the Yelp data set sentiment analysis and we have these uh, four patterns. And the only thing I want to point out in addition is that of course the patterns and the verbalizer have to be uh, very well coordinated because the verbalizer is what you substitute here for the mask and therefore you know, you have to choose a verbalizer that is uh, compatible, um, plays well uh, with the patterns. Uh, so that is one aspect of what makes uh, designing the task descriptions complex. Uh, here is um, our task description for the word and context task. Um, and uh, the easiest way to explain that, uh, to explain the task is to just read you our pattern. Uh, and the pattern is S1, S2, does W the same meaning in both sentences mask. So you have two sentences, they both contain, contain a word W. And the question is, does what W have the same meaning in both sentences, yes or no? So the verbalizer here is yes or no, and the two uh, classes are same sense, uh, different sense. Um, so uh, in contrast to the previous uh, task description, here, a lot of um, the work was done by the verbalizer. Uh, it contributes uh, important information for the task description. Here, the verbalizer is just a binary decision, so it's a, a very simple, and almost all the work is done by the pattern. 
And then the third example I wanted to give you is for the Venugrad schema challenge. Again, it's easiest to read the pattern to explain the task to you. In this case, the pattern is S in the previous sentence, the pronoun P refers to mask. So we have, um, we have a sentence and uh, we have a marked a pronoun in that sentence, he or she. And then the question is, what does um, this uh, pronoun refer to? In this case, the verbalizer and, and um, the uh, correct answer is always a noun that occurs in the sentence. Uh, um, uh, because pronouns usually refer to nouns. Um, and so here our verbalizer simply is uh, the identity function for all eligible words. So that's again, a quite different uh, task description, uh, at least a quite different verbalizer than before. So you can see that there's, there's a lot of variety in these um, task descriptions. So what exactly is the task description? It's not a simple description of the task, rather it's a complex translation of the structure of the task into plain text. Now, why plain text? Because that's what language models are trained on. That's what they understand, plain text. So for our approach, we need, uh, a, we need to use the medium that um, the um, language model understands and the medium is natural language uh, as exemplified by the pre-training corpora. And so uh, that um, uh, sounds simple, but it's actually very, can be very difficult to come up with a good translation of the task into plain text. Okay, let's uh, go to the experimental part, PET versus GPT-3. Um, actually, first, I'm just going to give you some experiments just on PET. Uh, here in the lower right corner, I'm going to show you the language model we're using because PET is uh, built on top of a language model because we're fine tuning a language model that's supervised part. Uh, and in this case, the language model we're using is Roberta Large. The task here is Yelp full. Um, and uh, we're using, uh, we're in a few shot setting, we have 10 training examples. Uh, the task uh, has five labels. Those are the labels I showed you earlier, one star to five stars. And uh, so we have five, we have uh, two training examples for each of the five classes, five times two. This here is the supervised performance. If you just fine tune Robert Large, and you can see that we basically have baseline performance, random performance uh, at uh, close to 20%. If we, um, uh, if we do that, and that shows you that 10 training examples are not enough to learn the task in regular supervised training. This here is PET unsupervised. I didn't explain uh, the unsupervised version of PET, but maybe you can imagine we do that. And uh, PET, unsupervised PET gets 33.8%. So just using the task description, no uh, labeled examples at all, we get an improvement of over 12%. And so that shows you already the power of the task description. Um, then uh, we, I showed you the four patterns we used here before. Uh, and it's interesting to note that the um, worst pattern gets 39.6% performance. The best pattern gets 52.4. So um, there's a big difference here. And uh, that brings uh, on the point that uh, it's important to use a variety of patterns because any given pattern may be may bomb and uh, give us really bad performance. And it's not something you, if you look at the patterns, you know which ones are going to perform well or which uh, won't. Let me read the patterns again. Uh, where do I have them? Here they are. Um, it was mask review, just mask review, blah, blah, blah. Uh, So if you look at these four patterns and I ask you, so one of them performed really poorly, which one was it? It's not really easy to tell, right? Uh, so that's why, and we don't have a deficit to uh, determine a good and bad patterns. So we need, that's why we need an approach that uh, is an ensembling approach. Um, okay. And then uh, if we uh, run regular pet and regular iPad, then we get 52.9 and 57.6 on Yelp with 10 training examples. And I think that's quite an impressive result. 
uh, and uh, um, I, I don't think there's any better results for, for such a small training. So that shows you how much you can get out of the task description. Um, all right, uh, th this I already covered. Um, then here uh, we see um, uh, the effect of the training set size. Uh, so this year I showed you on the previous slide, 10 examples. Um, if we go to 50 examples, we still find a big difference between supervised and pet. For 100 examples, it's still a difference of, uh, I guess, 9%. And then at some point uh, at 1,000 examples, uh, the difference uh, starts to vanish. This is what we would expect as we have larger and larger training set. The additional information that you get out of the task description is going to diminish. Here's a comparison with um, other semi-supervised methods with a UDA and mixed text. Again, uh, 10 training examples. Uh, so UDA, mixed text, PET, and iPad. And you can see that their uh, PET is, uh, outperforms these uh, in every case, especially on Yelp and on Yahoo. We have these big differences here. Um, uh, so that suggests that uh, um, it, it's not a fair comparison because UDA and mixed text don't have a task description. However, they use other sources of information. Um, uh, so the, the main point of this um, slide is simply to say, uh, for this, uh, for these uh, NLP problems, PET seems to be a very good approach, uh, and it's um, it seems to perform better than previous uh, semi-supervised work. Another important question is, how much does all of this depend on the particular set of examples you select? And uh, so what we did here is we took uh, three sets, uh, this, times of, uh, this time uh, three sets of uh, 32 training examples. Uh, and uh, for these super glue tasks, uh, we looked at the performance differences um, depending on which few shots uh, we selected. And you can see that in some cases, it, it actually um, matters a lot which training examples you select. And, um, and even in the average, you get uh, a difference of up to 5%. It's not so super surprising that if you are in a few shot setting that uh, it really matters uh, which um, shots you uh, select. And I mean, the summary of that is the choice of shots matters, but it's under investigated. And of course, it's a very important issue in few shot learning and should be reported as you uh, if you um, work on few shot running. And we have a on by uh, Meng Zhao uh, in ACL uh, 2021. So if you're interested in this issue, you can check that out. Okay, let's uh, go to the comparison between PET and GPT-3. So the key innovation in my view of, of GPT-3 is no supervised fine tuning for a specific task which is really uh, a radical and in a sense, beautiful idea to say, uh, we don't want, um, uh, we want to, we don't want to be in the, in these task silos, uh, separate model for each task. Uh, we want uh, to emulate humans in a sense who don't have the silos. They can just fluidly uh, solve even new tasks. And GPT-3 has this ability, which is uh, quite um, uh, amazing. Um, so, um, uh, and the, the, uh, so no fine tuning, uh, instead they do what they call in context learning as uh, so we have, the, um, I mean, the different versions of it, but one is what I showed you in the translation example, task description, a few training instances and a closed question. So, uh, GPT-3 reads this prefix, uh, uh and then uh, that prefix is enough for it to uh, get in a state where it can solve the task. That's the interesting and uh, I think amazing things, but amazing thing. But there's no, there are no parameter updates uh, during in-context learning. So I would say no real learning takes place for a specific task. It's actually not really learning. I mean, it learns a lot in pre-training, but then 
for a particular task, it doesn't learn anything. It can take into account the context, uh, and that's why it performs well, but it doesn't learn anything. But arguably, humans do do parameter updates when they learn. For example, you start from scratch when you open a second pomegranate a day later. So I showed you this video. Now you know how to open the pomegranate, or I mean, if you watch the entire uh, um, video. And then if tomorrow somebody gives you a pomegranate, you have retained some knowledge of how to open a pomegranate. You can apply that knowledge. In contrast, GPT-3 arguably doesn't learn anything after the completion of pre-train. So if you uh, um, metaphorically give a pomegranate to GPT-3 tomorrow, then it starts from scratch. It hasn't learned anything. So why not use both task description and supervised learning, which is what humans do. So that's the basic idea for PET, and that's what we're doing here um, in, in this work. And, and another way of looking at this is, uh, let's not artificially tie our hands. I mean, the GPT-3 folks had good reasons for doing this. And uh, I said, as I said, I think it's a very uh, thought-provoking and uh, radical idea. But if we want to solve a task in the real world, we shouldn't tie our hands. And if supervised learning helps us, then we should use supervised learning. Uh, and, and just to point out that uh, we, uh, our paper on PET, the first one came out in January um, uh, last year. Uh, and uh, um, GPT-3 came out um, uh, May last year. <clears throat> so, uh, our ideas predate GPT-3. Of course, you could say GPT-2 uh, preceded GPT-3 and was definitely before PET. But if you look at the GPT-2 paper, it doesn't really have these ideas. Um, you can kind of guess that they were going in that direction, but I think uh, we definitely made a very interesting original contribution here with PET. Uh, let's look at the, let's compare the sizes of the model, iPad versus GPT-3. So GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. GPT-3 MAT, uh, which we're also going to compare with, has uh, 350 million, and iPad has 223 million parameters. Those are the number of parameters of um, Albert XX large, which is uh, the um, model we're going to use here in the experiments uh, with GPT-3. So um, iPad has 0.1% of the parameters of GPT-3. It's a tiny model compared to GPT-3. Um, and uh, so it's gonna be interesting to compare their performance. Uh, so what we have here is uh, a contest between David and Goliath. Um, David is iPad and um, Goliath is GPT-3. And here we have the comparison. Um, uh, and in the interest of time, maybe I'm just going to look at the average. So we have here GPT-3, iPad, PET, and GPT-3 MED. Uh, and if you just look, this is Superglue, uh, which is one uh, an important uh, benchmark in NLP, 32 training examples. And yeah, let's just look at the average and you can see that um, PET is actually outperforming uh, GPT-3. So this is PET 74, iPad 77, and GPT-3 73. So we can say at a fraction of the size of the model, we get slightly better performance. So, I th so um, uh, this is a case of David uh, one against Goliath. So I think that's quite an interesting result. And why is that? Because we use supervised learning. So it shows you the power of supervised learning, uh, even if you just have uh, 32 training examples. Uh, if you exploit them uh, well, then you get um, a big boost uh, because of that. Okay, that's basically all I wanted to say about uh, that. And um, now the... Um, Debicing part is a little bit different. Um, the same ideas, we use descriptions to the task, but many of the other things are different. So hopefully it's not going to be too, uh, too confusing, but um, I, I think uh, it should be um, uh, reasonably self-contained. So uh, uh, what we want to do here is using patterns or descriptions to debiasing. And 
uh, we, we are using uh, proposing here a new approach which um, we call um, self-diagnosis that is the first step and then uh, self-devising which is the second step so let's start with self-diagnosis so the basic idea is upon self-reflection people generally know whether something they said is considered biased or not I mean, I, I'm assuming that everybody's familiar with the, the problem we're trying to attack here. Um, Pre-training corpora contain bias because they are produced by people and people are biased. So if you train a model on a very large corpus, then it will pick up the biases in that corpus. And that's a problem because if we then use uh, the pre-trained models for you know, uh, selecting job applicants, then the bias they've learned from the corpus may result in somebody not getting hired because of uh, the bias in the pre-training corp. So we are looking for ways to um, address this bias issue. Okay, so the basic idea of self-diagnosis is uh, upon self-reflection, people generally know whether something they said is considered biased or not. Now, they, they may not uh, it's not true for all, uh, in all cases, for example, you know, people are less sensitive or less knowledgeable about gender issues and depends a lot on the country and so on. Um, but generally, I, I think it is true to say that. Um, and it doesn't mean that they agree uh, that they shouldn't be biased. Uh, so they may say, uh, I know that, uh, you know, the liberal media consider this to be biased, but I'm going to say it anyway, because that's my opinion. Um, but but they know that, uh, quote unquote, uh, the liberal media uh, consider that to be biased. Uh, so so that's uh, a statement about people. And th so the question is, do language models have a similar capability? If you ask a language model, you just produce this. Do you think that it's biased? Could the language model actually tell us, yes, it's biased? So that's the basic idea of self-diagnosis. And uh, here's the pattern we use for self-diagnosis. Question, does the above, so this is uh, the um, sentence that we want to probe, is it biased or not? And then we simply ask the question, does the text contain Y, where Y is, um, uh, is uh, a particular type of bias? Um, so here's uh, an example, or in this case, um, uh, undesirable language, a cat, an undesirable language category. I'm blanking on the correct uh, term for that. So a threat is also something that we want to avoid or that we want to detect. For example, on social media, uh, if we see that um, one group of people is threatening another group of people, then we want to uh, take action and, and do something about that. Uh, so in this example, we're dealing with this uh, category of uh, undesirable speech threats. And um, uh, so here you have an example for the filter in pattern. I'm going to hunt you down. Question, does the above text contain a threat? And then we ask the language model, fill in yes or no. And depending on that, we can then uh, make, uh, take action if the language model says yes. Um, and so in our experiments here, we use six emotional concepts uh, covered by the uh, perspective um, API. Uh, we use the real toxicity prompt uh, data set uh, from Gibbon et al. And uh, we created a um, training set and test set um, for our test set, I should say, uh, for our purposes here by taking the top, bottom, and bottom 10,000 examples for each attribute. And um, uh, the, uh, there are six attributes, as I said, and uh, the self-diagnosis then classifies the output as biased, unbiased, simply by answering yes or no to each pattern. And uh, these are the results. So here you see the six uh, categories of bias, uh, toxicity, profanity, severe toxicity, uh, sexually ex uh, explicit identity attack and threat. And uh, here you see, and we're just going to look at the average, that's the curve you see here. And uh, we look 
we're looking here at uh, six different models, four GPT models and uh, two T5 models. And you can see that the smallest models do not, uh, cannot um, self-diagnose. 50% um, is the baseline. Since we constructed uh, the data sets to have equal numbers of toxic and non-toxic um, utterances. But if we go to the large models like T5XXL, they're doing actually a pretty good job. So in 87% of the cases, T5XXL can tell whether something is biased or not. I mean, that's not uh, something we can rely on for solving the bias uh, problem in natural language uh, processing. But I think it's a, it's a pretty good number. It's much closer to 100 than to 50. Uh, so uh, we believe that's a very interesting result. Okay, so building on self-diagnosis, we now do self-debiasing. The basic idea here is that we create an evil twin conditioned to produce biased output. So we take our language model and then we create this evil twin, which we tinker with so that it produces biased output. Then we compute the difference between the prediction of the evil twin and the prediction of the unchanged language model. Uh, and then we finally discount predictions by the difference. Uh, so um, the, the effect of that then is that for generations that are biased, they will decrease in probability. Generations that are unbiased will increase in probability. And therefore, the overall output that comes out at the end is going to be a lot less biased, hopefully. So uh, now I have to show you some offensive examples. I apologize for that, but otherwise, it's not really uh, possible to explain what's going on. Here's our either twin pattern. Um, and uh, simply the following text contains y, x. So we are, we are taking a language model, we're giving it this prefix here, and that turns the language model into an evil twin because now we uh, goad it in a sense to um, produce biased output. Uh, this would be an example of a filled in evil twin the text contains gender base. So then we just run our language model and may um, produce women, cannot, and then say code. So it probably wouldn't produce code if we didn't have this bias, but since it's been, uh, it's been uh, goaded to produce um, biased output, it will produce biased output. Um, and uh, just to give you the formulas here, so we the difference in prediction between the original language model and the evil twin version of the language model. And then we discount the uh, prediction by the difference uh, by just um, having a function of, the, of this delta and multiplying our probability, original probability with that delta. Uh, so that will decrease biased output and increase uh, unbiased output. So um, for this new uh, self-debiased model, PSDM, uh, women cannot code will become less likely and something that's not as biased like women cannot be ordained will become more likely. Here's our evaluation on, um, of uh, self-debiasing on cross pairs. So cross pairs um, is constructed as set of pairs of sentences. One sentence is uh, a neutral sentence, a more neutral sentence, and the other sentence is a more stereotypical sentence. And um, uh, and and so if if, uh, if a language model has picked up a lot of biases from the training set, then it will give preference to the stereotypical sentence. For example, women cannot code. Um, and uh, um, therefore it will say, well, the stereotypical sentence is more likely to have occurred. We'll give it a higher probability. Uh, a completely unbiased model will, will, will basically be a chance whether one or the other, the um, more um, 
neutral sentence or the, or the more stereotypical sentence will be preferred. So that means 50% is good. We are, we are looking for 50%. These numbers here tell you in, in what percentage of cases did the language model prefer the stereotypical version? So if that's 50%, we're good because that means we have a, a, a according to this test, completely unbiased model. Okay, so um, yeah, here you see the um, categories, um, the bias types uh, from the course pairs uh, data set. And so what we did was we uh, ran this on three models, uh, bird base, bird large, and Roberta. Uh, and here you see the comparison between um, the basic version without self debiasing and the version with self debiasing. And uh, a green arrow indicates that um, our results are better and a, a red arrow um, indicates that our results are worse. Um, and so overall, we see that uh, it seems to work pretty well. Um, the average is always down and we actually get a pretty big difference for Roberta of 65.5 to 58.8. So it becomes a lot less self-biased. You could say that the bias is almost half. Uh, and um, uh, that's significant because Roberta, since it's trained on a lot more data than um, BERT, BERT is basically just trained on Wikipedia. Uh, so Roberta has a lot of um, opportunity to pick up bias from social media and so on, or social um, uh, user-generated text. Um, uh, so it's it's a good sign that uh, Roberta, uh, for Roberta, we get a, a very strong reduction here. So that indicates that's, that it's working. Um, the, the main exception is sexual orientation. Uh, and there's an explanation for it, which I can try to remember if uh, you, um, you ask me that in the question period. Okay, so summary self-diagnosis and self-debiasing. LMs have a limited understanding of their own biases. I mean, it's good that they have some understanding of their biases. I think that's a somewhat surprising result, perhaps. Although it was not perfect, it was definitely there. Uh, we can exploit this for self-diagnosis and self-debiasing. This does not solve the problem of bias in LP models, but could be one tool in our toolbox. I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that there's going to be uh, an easy way of removing bias uh, from NLP models, you know, just one uh, silver arrow that does it. Uh, I think we probably need to combine different elements uh, in our approach. And I think this would be a very interesting element for doing that. Okay, last part, related work. So uh, there has been a lot of related work on this since um, Timo started uh, working on this in January of last work last year, and this is actually not updated. Uh, so it only contains, um, I think, uh, what we compiled um, three months ago. Um, and I apologize to anybody in the audience whose work I haven't cited here and uh, whose very relevant work I should uh, comment on. Just uh, talk with me in the question period and then we can um, remedy that. I just want to talk about three very important issues, I think, that, that occur um, in this field. Uh, right now, um, one is soft patterns. Uh, so um, in what I've shown you, um, we use words, natural language. So for example, uh, for, uh, in the, I would call that discrete patterns because we use uh, natural language words. So for textual um, entailment, for example, our pattern would look something like this. Uh, we have a premise and we have the word question. Then we have the hypothesis. Then we have the word answer. And question and answer are words that the language model understands. And here's the mask. Um, now, the soft version of that is that we um, still, of course, we need the input uh, premise and hypothesis, but then we just put some uh, um, uh, uh, randomly or perhaps uh, uh, not randomly initialized um, uh, embeddings here. And these are fine-tuned as part of the fine-tuning. 
And that's what's called the soft pattern. So basically, we get rid of uh, the words that we put in and, and just use um, an additional set of parameters, and those parameters are fine tuned. Um, and the, yes, the, the VN here are trainable embeddings. Uh, and uh, you can initialize them with words, uh, but they can also be randomly initialized. Now, soft patterns, it has been claimed, outperform discrete patterns uh, in some cases, which is not compatible with the story I've been trying to tell here, which is that it's great to use human expertise in uh, these types of situations. But I mean, it's, it's a little bit of complex discussion because usually soft patterns work well if you have lots of uh, training data not just 10 examples, for example. So the question is, are soft patterns really the right approach if you have uh, a truly few shot setting and we can do that. The second big issue is few shot learning. Um, I, I talked repeatedly here about death sets and few shot learning, do they make sense? And uh, an interesting recent paper is uh, two, true few shot learning with language model pairs, killer and show. Uh, and they try cross-validation and minimum restriction length to um, replicate a lot of uh, experiments in the literature that were do done with a deaf set. And they say um, it's possible to replace a deaf set with cross-validation and minimum description length. And that then casts a lot of doubt on uh, much work in future learning because it as I said earlier, relies on def sets. But if you have a de large def set, then you are not in a few shot learning. So they basically say in their paper, you know, um, true few shot, the, most of what's been published is not true few shot learning and is, is, has this really terrible flaw. However, uh, that's why I spent so much time talking about the ensemble, because we don't have to select the pattern. We just uh, use lots of patterns. And, and in their work here, Kiel and Show, I believe they only use single pattern approaches. But if you use an ensemble, uh, then you can, um, uh, you don't have to, you don't need the def set. So I, I think what they say doesn't really apply to our work. And, and we're working on this right now to, to write this up to make argument in a more cogent way. There is, but there is a big issue here, which is definitely an issue which uh, that I have presented. Uh, the variance, we, we need to assess the variance. And uh, I have done that for the, I've shown a little bit of data on that for the selection of few shots. Uh, that was the slide, the choice of shots matters. But um, I mean, that's definitely a flaw of what I have presented here that I haven't given you any numbers on the variance. So uh, that's that's something that, if we had to redo it again, we would also investigate the variance. And the third issue that I uh, think is important in this area is take the human out of the loop. Um, so I've emphasized here that the system creator designs patterns and verbalizes and is really important. So human input here is really important. So why can't we automate this? That's kind of the um, reaction you get if you present this in a core machine learning a forum, people ask, well, you know, that's really terrible that you need a human person. Uh, can we automate this? Um, and so I think the standard arguments apply. Adaptive bias, domain knowledge, limited amount of information in the few shots, uh, human learning, all, all of these arguments I've alluded to, at least in this talk. We need inductive bias for successful learning. We need domain knowledge, which in many cases, uh, the best person to, the best source of that is the human. A limited amount of information if you short learning. Information has to come from somewhere. Uh, human expertise is a good source. And human learning. Humans use descriptions, so our machine learning models should too. So summary, task descriptions, a new architectural element in machine learning. If you want to emulate human learning, then we should use task descriptions, uh, good results with small models on superglue, and uh, may even be useful for addressing uh, bias in NLP, as showed in the last part. And what I'm not saying here is that, of course, I think there's also um, a lot of um, uh, potential for this in other uh, in, 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 uh, sister fields, so to speak, like information retrieval. I would like to thank the European Research Council for 
uh, funding this work. Uh, and yes, that's the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rich. So we have, of course, time for questions, both in presence and online. Ari. Hi, Rich. Nice talk and nice work. So I had a question, a bit of a practical question, because I don't know Superclue uh, that well. So you said you use then 32 examples, uh, the instances. But how are those instances then transformed into the patterns and the verbalizers? Is that automatic or is that a manual process? I didn't quite understand. The, um, so I wouldn't call it a transformation. So basically, uh, you um, you look at the task as a human. You understand the task, and then based on that, you write uh, you write the pattern and the verbalizer. Um, and uh, okay, so I, maybe I can go into more detail on this. Uh, of course, there is then an interaction between the patterns of the verbalizers and the task uh, and the um, uh, the few shots you have. And that interaction is, so what Timo usually does is he, uh, um, he looks at the performance of the language model, the um, non-fine-tuned language model on, uh, for a particular pattern on those, let's say 10 training examples. So I showed you this one slide where you see that even unsupervised pet gets a performance that is clearly higher than random. So you can use the this unsupervised pet to see whether a particular pattern does well on the train 10 training examples. So that's not, in a sense you're using it as a dev set, you're using the training set as a dev set and you can do that because you're not training on it. And so if you have a pattern that does well on these 10 training examples in the um, untrained uh, setting, then it's likely to be a good pattern. If it is really terrible, then uh, of course it could become a great pattern through fine tuning, but maybe you know, you're going to look for other patterns that, that uh, even in that setting already have some good baseline performance. So there's no, I wouldn't say there's a transformation of the um, training examples into um, verbalizer and pattern. Basically that is a task of human ingenuity. You look at the task, you look at, uh, you have some understanding of what the language model can and cannot do. And based on that, you design your verbalizer and your pattern. I see. So do you also share the uh, annotated data set with patterns and verbalizers? Because I think that would be really useful for people trying to uh, replicate uh, your work. Yes, that's all online. I mean, there's not much to share. It's basically, um, I mean, the, the set of few shots uh, which uh, um, I think uh, Timo called it few, few glue uh, that's published. So you can directly replicate our results. Um, and the patterns, I mean, th th those are just a few patterns and the verbalizer task. So that's not a lot of data, but that is available and you can download it and uh, play with it. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you. And I see that there is David online. You, David, you can just speak. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Thank you for the presentation. That was very, very interesting. Um, I was curious. Uh, I think I, I missed a detail. You were talking about the the crows pairs for the debia thing. Um, I guess I was sort of a little confused on why the aim was fifty percent. Yeah, good question. It's it's a little complicated the setup, but uh, it's actually quite clever. Um, so the the cross pairs uh, can uh, consists of pairs of sentences. So so you you have uh, um, for each of the categories you have um, you you have a set of uh, sentence pairs, and uh, each sentence pair consists of a um, neutral sentence and a stereotypical sentence. So um, uh, for example. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can think of a good example. Um, 
uh, you know, yeah, uh, I, I won't give an example. Uh, or maybe since I'm a very old person, I can say uh, old people are slow uh, versus um, maybe um, um, it would be something like maybe young people are slow. That, so that's a simple uh, example. Old people are slow, young people are slow. So old people are slow is the stereotypical uh, sentence and young people are slow is the neutral sentence. Now, if the language model uh, says old people are slow is much more likely, then that indicates it has absorbed that bias from the training set, the bias against old people that they are slow. Um, and uh, so what these numbers here uh, basically tell you is in what percentage of cases did the language model prefer the stereotypical sentence? Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, sort of. I guess the the question I have is for your language model, wouldn't you prefer it to be below 50% if possible? Um, no, I, I, I mean, you could maybe argue that that's preferable, but I mean, you don't want it to be kind of uh, over anti-biased. Uh, you don't want it to give a preference to old people, for example. Uh, you want wanted to treat old people and young people the same way. So you don't want it to say uh, old people are fast and young people are slow. And that it's, I'm not using the right words, but it shouldn't have a bias for old people. It just should have no bias. Hmm. Okay, I think I'm uh, maybe my confusion was around the examples that it was being shown, perhaps. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for Mark? Uh, please come forward, otherwise, the mic does not work that well. Thanks for the great talk, Eric. Uh, item that I'm a little bit confused is on the um, task description, which seems to be kind of the uh, input source for pretty much everything, do you have the notion of quality or how, how good is the task? How, how does your system understand that this is a good task versus sloppy task definition? And therefore, what can we do with that? Yeah, that's really the, the difficulty, uh, I think, that um... And that's it's somewhat unsatisfactory that uh, th there is in this in the in the setting that we've defined here that there is no good answer to it. I mean, I already gave you the answer, the, the partial answer that maybe there is, which is uh, that exists, which is that um, you can do this zero shot evaluation of the task description. Um, you have, let's say, 10 training examples. You use your language model with um, the, the non-fine-tuned language model, just the language model um, that, um, th that isn't changed at all with the task description on those 10 training examples. And then if the task description works well, I mean, it g gives you a data compared to random uh, performance, then that's some indication that it's not a sloppy task description, that is, it is a helpful one. So, so there is some data there, uh, some uh, help uh, in deciding for or against a task description. But, um, so maybe I sh uh, should uh, just tell you why uh, Timo came up with this idea, because he, he's also working as a consultant, he's only a part-time or at the time was only a part-time PhD student. And um, uh, so he's working as a consultant and uh, he goes into companies and they have some problem. Uh, often it's a text classification problem and they want it to be solved. And then uh, the question is, how do you get a classifier up and running? And uh, of course you cannot uh, in most situations uh, do a big labeling job in the beginning. You can get some labels, uh, maybe 10, maybe 100, 
but you don't you can't get 10,000 and even 1000 1000 may be a challenge because if you're working with a small company then they may not have the resources they're really busy they have to earn money so they don't have the resources to uh, label uh, 1000 um, items and so the question is that situation what do you do and unfortunately you you are not you don't have the luxury of a, of what we have usually in our uh, experimental settings where we have a lot of data and we could of course and where we have large deficits you don't have them so the question is what is the best methodology for dealing with that situation that real world situation and unfortunately the reality is if you write down a task description then there's very little you can do to validate it um, you can do that zero, the zero shot validation that i described but Beyond that, I'm not sure there's, there's so many options. Did I answer your question? Yeah, that's uh, pretty close. So, so I guess maybe a follow-up would be, could be useful to see if you can use all these language models to quantify the task description. If you can put a feedback loop, given those charts that you're describing. So, so you uh, maybe fine tune it or yes, uh, something, like that. something like that. Yes. Right, but I mean there are two. Okay, yeah, that, that's I, I like that idea. Yes, because I mean, so my premise was that there are two things that make a task description a good task description. One is it actually reflects what the language model was trained on, so it's likely that it understands the task description from that point of view. And two, it is actually a good, it has a good correspondence to the task. Now, the second one is very difficult to um, de um, automatically evaluate. But the first one, I, I think I agree with you. That is actually something that can be uh, evaluated either through the language model directly or maybe by looking at the uh, pre-training corpus. So th that's, I think that's a promising direction. I like that idea. Thanks for the talk here, it's pretty good. Thank you. We have another question from Giorgio. Let me show you. Okay. Thank you very much for the great talk. I, I was very impressed by the, the results, but I want to go back to the very first slide or video. So you showed us this video where you told us to see the video and read the caption. And if I had only to read the caption, it would have been probably much harder for us, also for a human to understand, maybe it was not even mentioned from Granite. So it, it was easier for us, let's say, to uh, have information from the color of the fruit, from the fact that the user was using a bowl of water. So we, we, we had some previous knowledge about how we can cut fruits. The idea of uh, sectional fruit, even though it's a hard one, but you can elaborate on that. So I was wondering, are task descriptions a sort of proxy of the of the word for the machine learning algorithm to uh, to have some hints about what what the learner has to do, and that's why you need less uh, labels to train it. Could you say the last sentence again? Uh, so you could could the no. words be a substitute for something, or what did you say? Yes, could uh, could the, uh, the the task description be a proxy for uh, understanding better or having prior information about the problem? It's a, it's a sort of additional. I see. I understand. Yes. Yeah. So, so I mean, what I would like to believe, and I'm not sure I believe. It, so there, there's two issues here. One issue, of course, is that. Um, the, the example was very visual. And so uh, our language models have any visual um, uh, information, but let's abstract from that. Let's think if there was a pure text example, then I think uh, your question uh, applies very much. And uh, of course the hope would be that eventually we'll have language models that have uh, this knowledge. Uh, for example, you know, they know what scoring means. I mean, scoring a fruit is actually a very complex um, uh, notion. Uh, if you were giving that to, um, 
to an entailment engine, the, the types of entailment engines we have today, they probably would fail on that to, to understand what scoring a fruit means. Uh, but so the hope would be eventually we will have language models that do understand the meaning of score. Uh, that's why I kept saying uh, they have some understanding of language. Ideally, they should have a full understanding of language, including what the word score means. Right now, they don't. So we can either be we can either take the position eventually they'll get there. They they will uh, we will devise ways of pre-training them so that they know score, or we can take the position you know there's a limit. Uh, and we're close to that limit already, what we can learn with these unsupervised methods. And at some point we will need to inject knowledge. Um, maybe for example, in the form of knowledge graphs or in terms of ontologies or uh, some other explicit knowledge about what, what fruits are, how they are composed uh, and, uh, and so on. And, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have, a strong opinion on that because I, um, I was very surprised when these uh, pre-trained language models uh, came along and uh, they did much, much better than I would have expected. So, you know, maybe uh, next year, uh, somebody comes up with another innovation and suddenly they understand the word score. Uh, so I wouldn't completely exclude that. But if uh, your question came from the intuition that at some point we have to inject explicit knowledge here, uh, we won't be able to uh, do without that, then uh, I think I would share that intuition. I'm not sure whether I uh, got the gist of your question. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. There's time for a last break. All right. Alessandro, go. Um, hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate on um, biases in your deviasy, perhaps starting from the slide and the sexual orientation you mentioned earlier. Yeah, so let me try to remember what's going on with sexual orientation. Um, so it, it wasn't, it was a problem with cross pairs and not a problem with our uh, with our uh, approach, um, what's the problem again? Uh, um, I think for for these, I think our um, this evil twin thing doesn't work uh, for sexual orientation. Why doesn't it work? Uh, Yeah, I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember. So if you say the following text contains um, homophobic bias. Uh, yeah, it was some special uh, problem with um, how, how to set that up. I mean, was your question uh, specifically about um, anti-gay bias or? No, it was more in general about uh, general patterns that might be present in bias detection. So um, it might be better at detecting some sort of biases, but not other types of biases. Right. So it depends. I think the main variable here is the pre-training corpus. And that's why you uh, find um, uh, Where's the other numbers again? Um, th that's why, why you have this uh, pretty big difference between, um, for example, Bert Large and uh, Roberta, because Bert Large is mainly trained on Wikipedia and Wikipedia is a lot less biased because it doesn't contain social media you know, forums and stuff like that. And Roberta is, is, uh, is trained on the web and, um, Therefore, and there's a lot of bias on the web. So I think that's the main factor. So if you have, um, and, and it, it cuts both ways. Uh, on the one hand, the language model picks up the bias if it just generates without any constraints. On the other hand, 
it also has a good chance of learning to be self-aware, quote unquote, on that bias. So I'm not sure, maybe that's what, that's actually a very interesting question, whether there's a difference between how likely it is to pick up the bias and how likely it is to be, quote unquote, self-aware of the bias. Um, if the bias is very subtle uh, and people never call it out, uh, then, yeah, I think there's a very interesting research question here, which we haven't approached. Uh, why does this work? One theory would be there's actually a lot of explicit calling out of bias in the in the in the training corpora. Somebody saying that's homophobic, that's uh, anti-women, uh, and then it would be very easy for the language model to learn what it means to be homophobic or anti-women. Um, uh, so, um, and, and then uh, I think your question could be, are there, I mean, one form of your question would be, are there biases where you never have that explicit calling out of the bias and therefore our approach is not going to learn them? But, uh, we haven't investigated that yet. Right. So you would think that in most cases, it, um, there, there are instances where the training corpus says this explicitly. Uh, uh, something uh, sexist, and then um, this is sexist. I think so, because in social media, there is a lot of discussion on that, I would think, that right. uh, because people are struggling with these issues, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we most people care about not being biased, and that leads to discussions where bias is explicitly discussed. Right, thank you. Thank you, Nirich. I think we are out of time. So we thank you very, very much. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your attention and for a very interesting discussion. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, and OK, we hope to see you in person as soon as possible. And have a nice day. We will be online all day 